Yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and just discuss a bit of the work I've been doing uh, in the free state and the grass and only since 2017. Um, so based on the title, I've been working on montane areas, uh, so I'll, I'll speak mainly about the montane areas, but it, it, it's a grassland, it's mountain grassland, so I also incorporate a lot of the invasives uh, that we find in the grasslands, which is the majority of the free state. So firstly, I mean, everyone should know that our mountains in South Africa are particularly important. We've been talking about invasive species and their threat to our uh, water systems. And our mountains in South Africa are the main water catchments for just about the whole country. I mean, the, the rain that's falling in the Drakensberg gets used in Johannesburg and Durban and everywhere. So it's incredibly valuable as a water resource. But they also have incredibly high endemism and biodiversity. Uh, so systems like the Cape Floristic region and the Cape Fold Mountains, as well as the Drakensberg, have a mega, mega amounts of um, endemism uh, and biodiversity. So they're really, really important. And obviously with that kind of biodiversity, they're valuable to the people living in those environments. Um, and I've got a little schematic there of our mountain systems uh, that we've actually just recently developed. Uh, there wasn't a clear um, designation of what we call mountains in South Africa because we can't base it on altitude because some that we would call mountains based on altitude wouldn't even uh, be registering in the Drakensberg, for example. Uh, so that's sort of, when I'm talking about mountain systems, we're talking about those systems there. Um, but I'm going to specifically be focusing on the grassland biome um, uh, and therefore the Eastern Great Escarpment or the Drakensberg. So, with these systems and with all our other systems, they're incredibly invaded in South Africa uh, with invasive species. Uh, 700 species on the member lists. Um, I mean, every biome, every ecosystem is some way invaded in South Africa. Our water systems are invaded, our, our deserts are invaded, etc., etc. And these are having severe uh, environmental, uh, economic, and what's the third one? Well, impact anyway. And those are the things I've been focusing my research on. Uh, and so, uh, the problem is with the mountain systems is they've been really neglected uh, with regard to this research into, into the impacts on invasive species. Uh, they also, with climate change, they're becoming increasingly invaded. Uh, and we haven't really studied what the impacts are and how they're being felt in these mountain systems. Um, and so I'm going to go through one or two examples of those quick today. Um, with regard to that, there has been, the majority of research that has been conducted in South Africa has actually been in the Cape Fold Mountains, uh, and really these mountains in the Drakensberg, especially the Eastern Drakensberg, have really been neglected with regard to invasive species research. Uh, so that's just the, all the pictures aren't great, but the top, the pines, the hackiers, really well studied, the, the use of water, uh, the management well studied with now mountain systems, which we about Rabinia, Gladitsia, uh, the Rosaceae species, really understudied. We really don't even know how to start managing uh, those invasive species in our systems. Uh, and if we look at the number of invasives in the, in the different mountain systems, uh, this is a study I was part of recently, uh, where we just looked at the records that were available to start getting a an indication of what species we're dealing with and how many of those species um, there are. And so we looked at the SAPI database, uh, iNaturalist, uh, and uh, general botanical surveys that have been conducted. And you can see that Eastern Great Escarpment, which is a little green line on the top there, is just on a straight upwards curve with regard to amount of species, um, as well as unique species, which is the bottom one. So even though it's really understudied, uh, it is the biggest one granted, um, but it has an ever-increasing at the moment amount of invasive species and just new species. So if you go into those systems and have a look, you'll find species that weren't reported previously, as well as more species of the ones that already existed. So we're really uh, working in a system that's highly invaded and going to continue to be invaded going forward. Um, uh, smart changing here. And so just to highlight again, uh, the green areas, these are the, 
the current records of invasives in South Africa, the green ones are SAPIA database, uh, the black ones are iNaturalist records, uh, and GEDs are specific botanical surveys. Um, the colors are a bit poor, but you can see the high density of, of invasives we're dealing with in the Drachtenberg mountain system. Uh, and you can then just see within, this is a grassland biome with the orange, and then the, the green color there is uh, the high montane grassland system. So you can see the overlap between the mountains and the grassland biome. So in 2017 is really when Working for Water started funding research, uh, the DFFE, into these uh, invasive species in the mountain regions. And out of that list of um, ever-increasing invasives, uh, through uh, general um, stakeholder involvement, we came to a list of species that we were going to start initially working on. These were based on abundance, uh, potential impacts, uh, and just recommendations from uh, researchers working in basic species. Uh, so that's a list of species I'm involved with and that we've been uh, looking at over the last five years. So I'll leave it up there just for a little bit so anyone who can reads it and recognizes those species and has some information to contribute or would like some more information on those species, uh, I'd be yeah, really willing to chat to you about it. I just want to run through one example out of these species. Obviously, we could speak about any of them, uh, but it's one which is one I've worked on quite extensively, is Rabinia pseudoacacia. Many of you, if you've come from the Bloom area, will know the species. It lines the streets in Bloom and anywhere where you find a bit of a, uh, an area that's starting to get degraded and there's people harvesting fuel, but you'll see it start popping up and becoming denser and denser. So it's a species that derives from the Appalachians um, in North America. Uh, it was moved across to Europe about 400 years ago, and it's the most widespread invasive in, in Europe. Uh, in some countries regarded as a really bad invasive, but because they manage their woodlots a bit better than in some countries in Europe, they quite quite like it, so it's a bit of a conflict in Europe. Uh, but it has this distribution in South Africa, and you can see very much fits into the focus area I was identifying earlier. Um, also, now its leaves are starting to go yellow, so when you leave, you'll see the, the, the streets, uh, the trees in the streets are already going yellow, and those are, many of them are Ravinia, but um, in spring and early summer, you can really pick it out by these huge white flowers that down the whole tree, so it makes it quite easy to pick it out. And then once you start seeing it, you'll see it. It's very, very prevalent throughout the free state. Uh, and increasingly, we're starting to see these invasions that look like this. As, as I mentioned, we're in the grassland biome, so just like everything you see should be grass. So if you start seeing trees more than grass, you know we're losing the ecosystem. Uh, and so this is an invasion uh, near the town of Clarence. Um, you can see one or two of the other Invasive, there's a, a willow tree in the middle, but you can get an idea of how big these invasions can get. So as a start to motivating to work uh, on invasive species, it's good to, uh, to try and determine the impacts. So I'm very much involved in determining impacts for two reasons. One, to argue for resources, they're having these impacts, therefore we need money to manage it. But also, for if we do start managing them in time, uh, I specifically work on biological control, is that we have a, a benchmark that we can say, well, in 2017 it looked like this, and in 2030 or 2050 is probably where I start thinking we might see some changes. Uh, we've had a change, hopefully an improvement, or at least a slowing down of the impacts we're monitoring. So, uh, over the last couple of years, I've been um, measuring a number of environmental parameters regarding these trees, uh, how they're affecting the temperatures at ground level uh, within the invaded populations, how they're affecting uh, the general biodiversity in the systems, how they're affecting ecosystem services. Uh, so I'll just go through one or two of those examples. Uh, the first one is, uh, because it's a, a legume tree, uh, it's legume, it's, it's, it's um, putting nitrogen into the soils, and affecting the soil. So we are looking at uh, what are the impacts on the, the rain, on the grazing uh, underneath Rubinia stands uh, in the free state. So this was more on the grass environment, specifically in the mountains. Um, and you can, the photo's a bit dark here, but you can usually clearly see under the stand of Rubinia, it's, it's green, 
green grass where it's outside there, it's just the normal felt that we're more accustomed to. Uh, and when we started looking at the species of uh, grasses involved, uh, we could see that the landscapes under, underneath Rubinia were uh, completely transformed. The grasses growing under them were nearly always um, shade tolerant, uh, nitrous, uh, high nitrogen loving species, and, ju and just about always they were also invasive species, and most of them had low grazing capacity. So they're affecting the, the quality of the rangelands uh, where they're growing. Uh, and that's coupled uh, along with the fact that uh, it's actually poisonous. It can't be grazed by livestock. They become slowly anemic. So it's not a fast poison that you notice your livestock uh, died after eating it. It would be months later that they start showing the de degradation in health. Um, we did some, we can work with some uh, uh, guys to determine the economics just with regard to the impact on grazing in South Africa. Uh, and we came up with a figure, it's quite broad, but it's quite significant. So, Rubinius in the grassland biome is costing us between 130 and 961 million rand an annum uh, as impact on just grazing agriculture on livestock. Uh, we then looked at, remember in the beginning I told you about these big white pendulous flowers. So, we went to areas where the tree is growing near to orchards, uh, specifically apples and cherry orchards. And we're investigating if they were stealing the pollinators uh, from the, from the uh, commercial crops. Um, we tried to actually do it with indigenous plants, uh, but there was such a high percentage of pollinators on Rubinia that we never got a number for the indigenous plants that were flowering at the same time. So indigenous plants growing near to Rubinia are in really deep trouble if they flower at the same time. They are getting no pollinators. Uh, with in crops, we found that there was a higher density of pollinators moving to the Rubinia stands. Uh, we weren't able to clearly show that they were uh, causing a reduction in produce, uh, but they were obviously competing. I mean, the, the, the bee visitation rates were uh, similar or higher on Rubinia growing close to apple orchards. So you would expect with that you're going to get a reduction in yield uh, within these orchards. Um, and so we've, we've clearly showed all the, the impacts that are having. Um, and so then we also looked at, are we winning with regard to management? A lot of the stuff we've seen today has been, Debbie spoke about the herbicides. And there is a quite a nice case study I've been involved in, in, in Clarence, uh, that big population of Rubinia I showed at the start of this talk. Uh, and they've been trying to manage that population in Clarence as well as a number, for about, uh, a number of others around the town for about 20 years. Uh, using cut stump and foliar herbicides. Um, I just want to check out that for a second. There you are. Um, so the four sites, if you're familiar with Clarence, or when you're leaving the neck towards Bethlehem, and this is near the Battle of Town, near the Municipal Dams. Uh, and they've actually trialed a, a couple of different herbicide uh, applications, so it hasn't really been ad, ad hoc, it's been significant programs. Uh, where they've cleared out entire catchments using cut stump. Uh, so these were completely covered in Rubinia, cut them all down and applied the right herbicides. Because it's gone for 20 years, the herbicides have obviously changed. Um, but in general, the practice has been pretty good um, from what I was able to follow. And here's just a summary of what's happened and the money that they've invested. So starting in 2006 to 2008, we did water programs. Invested 7 million, then ran water, invested into it as well. Uh, they put in 2 million, and then once ran water moved out, the clients Conservancy uh, have been putting in, and they, they're continuing the control. They put in hundreds of thousands of rand. So at the time when we were doing the study, we calculated that they put in about 10 million rand into these, what in general is quite small infestations of invasive species in South Africa. So 10 million rand over a small 20 hectares, let's call it. Over the 20 years, the population size has increased by 400%. So it really is a losing battle um, with those kind of scenarios. It nearly suggests that the more money you put in, is actually the, the population is going to spread faster. So I'm involved in the, uh, the management of that now, and I, what we've suggested is do not touch it. I mean, just leave it alone. Because if you chop it, it's very fast. So it's a really lose-lose situation. Um, however, I, 
I specialize in uh, biological control, so we've been looking at biocontrol options for Ruminia. Uh, luckily, species that come from the USA are really well studied. Uh, they just, they don't have as, as much diversity as us, and they've got a lot more scientists, so they, they thoroughly investigate everything they've got. So just from the literature, I could work out there's some really good options for us to use as biocontrol options uh, for the species. Um, and so I looked at all the species that were available, and I was able to prioritize uh, some of those species. Uh, and I've been looking at two little midges uh, to bring into South Africa. What's interesting about these midges is, uh, I mentioned at the start of my talk, this tree's been in Europe for 400 years, is these midges made it across from the USA into Europe, uh, and they showed significant um, reduction in growth rates in European trees compared to trees in South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand because of these midges that were already there. So it gives me a lot of hope that if we bring these midges in, prove they're safe for release and release them, uh, that we're going to at least try and slow the spread of Rubinia in South Africa. Um, so sort of just on our normal uh, predator-prey uh, graph here, I'm assuming that's where Rubinia is at the moment. It's actually probably still going up, so it go like that. And hopefully we can bring these two measures in there and start getting a reduction. And with that reduction, because I have these measurements we've been taking over the last five years on economic, environmental, and social impacts of Rubinia, that maybe in 20 years' time, when it's getting down here, I'll have something to compare uh, those results to. Uh, yeah, so that's a little story just on Rubinia. I want to touch on just some things I find quite interesting. I've been working on uh, invasive rosaceae in the grasslands, and anyone who's been driving around the free set would have seen at the moment the fire pools are they're just spectacular in winter. They, these, the big uh, red and orange berried shrubs you see. Uh, that bird's sitting on one there. Uh, so I've been looking at what's fueling those, those invasions in South Africa because uh, you know, no other countries on Earth are invasive rosaceae, Cotani acid, pyrocantha, um, as invasive as they seem to be in the free state. Uh, so I've been trying to work out if I can find out the reason or maybe we're just ahead of everyone else and they're going to become a problem there. So we, we're getting more and more of these ecosystems in South Africa where it's just a red sea. Um, when I started the program, I drove around and I, I knew about five or ten. I now know a couple of hundred of just landscapes that are just 100% covered in these invasive um, rosaceae, red berry uh, bushes. And so I've been looking at every aspect of them. And the first one I talk about is pyrocantha. Um, and you'll see them there, that's a classic picture of them lining roadways, fenceways, just open felt so there. Um, they really don't seem to be limited to one place. Um, they don't seem to be limited to one ecosystem within the grass of the biome. They're just, they're just popping up everywhere. Uh, so the first thing I just wanted to check was how viable are the seeds and how many seeds are being introduced into the environment. Um, so we started sampling different ecosystems, rivers, uh, corpies, and just open felt. And we, we created a little uh, sort of mathematical equation to determine how many seeds are, are being introduced into the environment by each one of these invasives, invasives per meter of invasion. So if you have one meter of invasive rosaceae, how many seeds is that, is that contributing into the environment? And the numbers are truly staggering. So that there is 20 million. So for every meter of those red bushes you see, there are 20 million seeds going in. So an average tree per annum is putting hundreds of millions of seeds into our system. So the first thing um, we found out is that it's growing that fast because there are so many seeds uh, entering the, the system. And so then we wanted to see how those seeds are getting around, are the wind dispersed, water dispersed. Um, and so we've been looking at uh, birds and rodents and their contributions to um, spreading these invasives. So this graph here is each one of those are just a different kind of bird. So it's starlings, mouse balls, bulbuls, uh, and different, they're just different bird species. And what happened was we fed them uh, these fruits and then we germinated those. Well, then we, once they got through the bird, we saw how fast they germinated. And 
the days on here. So if a seed passes through a bird at about 20 days, they start germinating. Um, the one line that sticks out here is the control. So that is, if it doesn't pass through a bird, uh, how fast it germinates. So you can see birds which are really prevalent now in these grass and fruity balls that we never really used to get are now very common. Every seed they eat, they're germinating it significantly faster than if uh, it wasn't eaten. So the birds are also really speeding this, the spread of this thing on. So um, birds coupled with this high number of seeds is one of the reasons that's driving the invasion faster and faster. Um, I wanted to see how fast, so all those seeds are then landing in the ground, uh, on the ground and forming these quite significant seed banks. And lots of invasive rosaceae we have seed banks that can last 40 years, 50 years. Uh, so for this species we had a look at how long the seeds were surviving in the seed bank. And so we took seeds and just planted them in the felt and then we're, we're digging them up every few months. And luckily for us, after six months, none survived. So for this species, it has a really short lifespan in the soil. So it's actually hope for management. So if you cut it down and keep it down for a year and manage whatever comes up after that, the seeds in the seed bank are actually going to um, not persist. So management for pyrocanthia, even though it's really sharp and spiny and terrible to manage, uh, one or two repeats uh, application, you actually should get decent control of it and even working fire management into it with something that has such a short lifespan as well should, should work. Um, however, it's not alone as invasive rosaceae are going. Uh, Cotoniaster, which is silver-leafed uh, Cotoniaster, so Pyrocanthus got the orange berries and Cotoniaster has the red berries. Um, it seems to be very highly underrepresented in any of the in Sapia or in the, 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 the databases. There's a huge amount of it, but nobody seems to recognize it. Uh, and so I was doing very similar studies with this to see how, how it's, if it's being fueled by the same mechanisms. Um, and the first thing we did again was to see what's eating it and what's spreading it around, uh, around the, the countryside. And, and it was quite interesting. Uh, Pyrocanth was heavily, heavily bird dispersed. Uh, whereas Cotoniaso was very infrequently dispersed by birds, but heavily dispersed by rodents. Uh, so it seems like they've, they've each cornered a little part of the market and then they're keeping away from each other. So one's being spread by birds and the other's really being spread by um, rodents. Uh, and we also found it seems to be dominated uh, along waterways more than Pyrocanthia. So uh, into cliffs and valleys you're getting this more dense Cotoniaster infestations uh, compared to Pyrocanthal, which just seems to be invading everywhere. And again, we looked at how many seeds are being produced uh, per square meter of invasion, and once again, we're up in the millions uh, of seeds per square meter. But more concerningly is with this one, when we planted the seeds in the soil uh, to see what the lifespan is, how long these seeds are potentially surviving, uh, this was at the start of the year, we are at 365 days, so they've been in the soil for a year, I've been taking them out every 12 months, and we're down something like 1%, so a year later, only 1% has died, so this is, it's ongoing, it might go 20 years, but at the moment, they're, they're not dying, so it's going to be, it's not as thorny as pyrocanthus, so cutting it down a bit easier, but this, this, the seeds are going to be in the soil for a lot longer, making it much more difficult. A target for control. Uh, some of the other species we've looked at uh, are quite interesting with regard to, we spoke to conflict of interest species. One of them is over there, I see it's got a little picture for it, it is Rosa rubiginosa, uh, also really common. I really like its distribution in South Africa, you can see a little green dots, it really <laughs> hugs the area where I work, so it's uh, always like it because it's can show this and say I work on weeds that grow here, um, and it's um, and it's driven by uh, it really needs cold stratification to get the seeds to germinate. So it needs about 60 days below zero for the seeds to germinate. So it really is restricted to where it gets that many cold days. Um, 
And so it's a 2B invasive species in South Africa. And about five years ago, they worked out if you crush the seeds, it makes a really valuable oil for, cos the, for the cosmetic industry. And so people like these little companies started popping up that uh, were offering uh, six rand a kilo for people to bring in uh, the hips. Uh, and then it took off in Lesotho because it's a really, really well, well, very abundant plant in Lesotho. And this industry has just grown exponentially. So I've been looking at it for five years for management, but now it's employing thousands of people and it's a, like a, a multi million rand industry. So this is a species I don't think, I think it's actually going to move off it 2B as we go into the next couple of years. I know people have been writing applications and doing risk assessments already on it to try and get it up off being a 2B uh, because of this industry. And I think if you start planting it, uh, there's significant opportunity there. But I've been involved with it very much as an invasive. Um, where it forms these really dense stands, so I've still been investigating its impact and its impact in Lesotho, uh, and it's, it decimates environments, it turns into these monospecific stands dominated by mice, because so many mice, uh, this thing here, is this the shells of mice, where well, mice have eaten the seeds and just left their shells lying on the, uh, on the felt. And so there's, you get these systems of roses with no grass and nothing else and just thousands of mice, so the impacts are quite severe. So, yeah, it's an interesting story, I don't know where we'll go forward with it. Uh, Ruber species, everyone loves the blackberries, but if you drive around the free state, the, the, the infestations of the brambles are getting just more and more significant. Um, and it's an incredibly complex thing, because we have indigenous species, we have invasive species, and then they've hybridized. So we have these indigenous invasive hybrids. So I don't know where you go to with management on that, especially because I don't, there's probably one individual in South Africa who can identify all the species. Um, and so if you go and manage rubus, you're probably going to manage some of the indigenous species as well as alien species and the half breeds. So it's a very tricky conflict species also going forward. Uh, a nice one for the free state, everyone loves the Wilhelm Wurma, uh, the Wurma trees. Uh, so I've started a project we're actually um, running a machine learning algorithm with Google Street View uh, to map the willows of the free state. So you just run an algorithm through uh, the Street View and it picks up and maps where it finds willow trees around the South Africa. We're comparing it to work done uh, by Leslie Henderson in the 70s. So she mapped all the willows and their densities in the free state in the 70s. And we're comparing it to what we've been finding now in Google Street View. And it's still quite early in the story, but uh, as far as I can see, the willows are going extinct in the free state. Something's happened, I don't know if they don't like the climate, or, but if you drive around, you'll very, very infrequently see young populations of willows. They're all old trees, old dying trees, and so they're not a classic invasive species model anymore. Like a, a good invasive species is lots of young trees and you don't see it in the free state anymore. So this is a conflict of interest species that nobody wanted to manage the willows because everyone liked how they looked in the environment, but somehow they're managing themselves. I don't know the mechanism yet, um, but it seems like that's a conflict of interest that might go away by itself. Um, yeah, and thank you. That's, just the people I, I work for and uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Grant. Any questions for Grant on the wonderful work that he's doing? I mean, I learned something about um, rodents dispersing, but that's me ask them. We've got a problem here. Who's, who who's has to look after all those stands on the N1 that run through the time? Nobody here responsible? No? No? No Sandra? No? <laughs> no questions for Grant. Grant, thank you so much. I think it was extremely informative and congratulations on the good work you did. Thank you for sharing it with us.